Mache. My name is Fred Rickard. I am the community coordinator for the Moose River Heritage and Hospitality Association. Welcome to the Pajamonic, celebrating our storytelling. I would like to thank all who have contributed to making this possible, and we hope you enjoy it. Miigwech. A chill runs through your mind when you realize your life is on the line. Hello, uh, this is uh, Bob Sutherland. I'd like to welcome everybody to the storytelling. And uh, I would like to, uh, I will be praying for uh, for everyone that everything will be good. Everything that people want to share, the storytelling, the history of the, of our area and how special it is for our people to remember the past and bring it to our younger generation, how our community has evolved through storytelling. And I would also like to uh, thank the uh, organizers of uh, getting this storytelling going. It's a very important part that we understand all the things, the positive things that our community has done in the past and to keep going with our culture, remembering how to preserve wild food, how to preserve and keep our land uh, clean, our waters clean, so that our future generations, our young people, will have that for seven generations to come and that they in turn will be keeping the, these stories alive that we're going to be sharing in the next few days. And I welcome everyone, and, uh, and I thank you all. Hi, I'm Bernice Kapashusit. I'm from Moose Factory, Ontario, and I'm part of the committee for this more than 350th uh, commemoration that will be happening in 2023. And along with, with me is my um, co-chair, uh, Virginia Barter. Virginia? Hi, um, I'm actually uh, calling in from Toronto. That's where I live. But I spend a lot of time up in the James Bay area, visiting my family up there and uh, staying connected with, with uh, that part of the world is, uh, 
is really important to me. And my grandmother comes from uh, Fort George on the east side of James Bay and uh, her father as well. So, you know, we go back a lot of generations in, uh, in James Bay. And uh, everybody passed through Moose Factory. And, and I have, there's lots of stories in our family about Moose Factory and pictures and all kinds of heritage that I've learned uh, over the years. And I really hope that I can share a lot of what I know uh, and, and have come to understand about that connection over the course of our projects that we'll be doing. I'm a real history buff and I, I really, uh, we can really focus on, on that in a really exciting way for, for people. So back in January, 2020, the Moose River Heritage and Hospitality Association uh, had an initial meeting and uh, uh, was advertised throughout the community and people who were interested in being part of the committee uh, came out for that initial meeting, which was um, that cold winter night. But, and we'd like to actually, from there, we'd like to invite others to come and join and be a part of this committee and you know, share your stories and your expertise in the, um, you know, the heritage and culture of um, Moose Factory and area. So this storytelling event that uh, we're having today is uh, the first of a series of events, 12 actually, that will happen over the next two years leading up to the launch of the 350th anniversary in 2023. We're asking um, local organizations to appoint a representative from your organization or association to become a part of our committee. So some of the projects we've been uh, considering for 2023 uh, are lots of cultural and musical events, music festivals, uh, maybe film festival, uh, an international uh, conference or symposium, um, maybe even a documentary project or a commemorative book, uh, which I think would be really exciting. And um, Bernice, what else? Yeah, I'd like uh, to add uh, that during the gathering of our people and hopefully by 2023, we'll be able to gather again, which is always an awesome um, week of events in itself, but adding to that, um, inviting uh, musicians perhaps from the Orkney Islands, uh, as you said, you know, um, uh, having music part of it and uh, many of the local artists to come out and, and uh, the fiddlers and you know just all our local talent we have so much in our communities so these events will have a quite an international flavor to them as well because we we really want to extend our hospitality to to those beyond our communities beyond moose factory and moosini and and james bay but but also even across the atlantic in addition a committee has been set up uh, for the restoration of St. Thomas Church as a heritage site. And um, the co-chairs are Norm Wesley and Logan Jeffries. And we hope you enjoy the rest of our program today.
This is Stan Wesley's Moose Factory Heritage Moment. Oh, you're deadly. This has been Stan Wesley's Moose Factory Heritage Moment. Watch it. My name is Stan Kapishisit and I'm the board chairperson for the Moose River Heritage and Hospitality Association. We call it Mr. Ha for short. I'm also the appointed board member for Moose Creek First Nation, where I work as the Director of Economic Development. The MRHHA was evolved out of the Moose Factory Tourism Association, co-founded by Moose Creek First Nation and Mo Quebec in 2004, and a gradual merger with the Moose Factory Historical Association, which started up in 2007. The MRHHA has three founding jurisdictional members, Moose Cree First Nation, Mokrebeck Iyud, and the town of Moose Nien, each of which appoints a representative to our nine member board. Our other six board members are grassroots community members, at least one from each jurisdiction, who are elected from and by our other association members, usually at our AGM. In addition to the jurisdictional and individual members, our association is also open to other organizational and business members who want to help us build a future with our shared past based on our shared vision, mission, and guiding principles. These were outlined at a two-day brainstorming session co-sponsored by the director of MFTA, Laurie Sutherland, and the coordinator of MFHA, Cecil Chabot, in 2008. It was attended by Doug Jeffries, Clarence Trapper, Bert Wapachi, Geraldine Governor, Alan Jolly, Sinclair Trapper, Bert Morrison, the late Jimmy Small, John Beck, Victor Linklater, Stan Ludet, Greg Williams, Greg Spence, and Richard Grohm. The vision statement is as follows. We share an interest in the rich historical and cultural heritage of Moose Factory, Moose and in the Moose River region. That historical and cultural heritage is primarily Omishkego, but includes major contributions from other peoples contributions that have become part of the present day's communities, political, social, religious, economic, and cultural fabric in the course of its long evolution that predates Moose Factory's establishment as a fur trade post in 1673. As demonstrated by our community's additional EU, Orcadian, Scottish, English, Norwegian, and French heritage, hospitality has long been one of the most important aspects of Moose Cree and Omishkego culture. The mission statement is as follows. The purpose of this association is to preserve, document, promote, and perpetuate our historical and cultural heritage and our tradition of hospitality. We believe that this will have enormous benefits for ourselves, our communities, as well as a broader society to which we continue to contribute. Our nonprofit association draws on the support of our leadership, councils, and jurisdictions, and includes elders, youth, harvesters, community members and hosts, filmmakers, librarians, spiritual leaders, community researchers and educators, university and college professors and students, musicians, artists, and many others who have a passion for our combined heritage. The MRHHA is in a new major development phase since the last year of 2020, and we have a part-time executive director, Cecil Chabot, and a part-time community coordinator, Fred Rickard. So we thank you for participating in the storytelling initiative and we hope you enjoy uh, the stories and we look forward to future events. Miigwech and have a good day. Bye. Mashkigo. Travel 
Director of Language and Cultural Programs at Muscree First Nation. I've been involved with the Heritage Committee for a number of years as the co-chair. In 2023, it'll be 350 years since uh, we've had European contact, and there will be a number of activities planned to, leading up to 2023. These will showcase our tradition and history as a kind and sharing people. We have always maintained our identity as Muscree Lilwuk. And I would encourage people to come out and take part in all the different activities that will be planned. Hi, my name is Norm Wesley and I've been asked to tell a legend for this program. And, um, I'm going to break a rule here in uh, doing this. I don't read legends because tradition has it that you tell legends without reading. But I'm going to break that rule. Why? Because this legend was actually uh, um, uh, translated from Cree into English um, as told by one of our own people, uh, the late Johnny Carpenter. And Johnny Carpenter is, uh, is quite a man. I knew him personally. Some of you knew him personally. Hey, some of you may be grandchildren of, uh, or great-grandchildren of, of the late John Carpenter. This is his story, a legend. Why the water in James Bay is salt? I'll tell the legend. I'll tell about it. Long, long ago as it happened, we used to Kajak, as he was called, to a feast for the animals. And he invited all the animals. Whatever they must have eaten, I don't know, but everyone, every beast was there. So then, so then they began. One person only they did not invite, the wolverine. That was the one whom they did not invite. Then and ever since then the wolverine has been feared by everybody. The animals have been afraid of him right up until now. That must, that must be why they did not in, invite him. At last, however, while they, while they began, when they were halfway through the dinner, eating dinner, one of them was sent to keep a lookout. See what he see. See whatever he's coming. Whether he's coming, I'll go too," said the fox. "I'll go the fastest." "No," said another. "You can't," said the weasel. "I shall go," the weasel said. "I'll be able to tunnel under the snow as I run about, keeping a lookout for him." So then, they told him to go, and now, sure enough, he came and he saw him as he came into view. Then this weasel ran back. He went to tell his fellow creatures. Now he's really coming into sight, he said to them. So again they went around the circle, making 
a choice of someone who would meet him. So then I will go, said the bear. No, he was told, you're too slow. So then, and so then the wolf said, I will go. I'm very good at dealing with a person one way or the other. At last the skunk spoke up. He said, I shall go. I'm not afraid of anybody. That's what he was told. And so the skunk was allowed to go. And the skunk set out right away. Very soon he met him. Now then, the wolverine was asked, where are you going? I want to come to the feast which Wisa Kajak has given, he said. I must, you must not go, the animals. The animals don't want you. They are afraid of you. You're too anxious to be in charge of everything. You want to spoil. You want to spoil everything, he said to him. So then, then this fellow, but the wolverine didn't like being spoken to this way. I am going all the more, he said. Now then, he was about to go, but the skunk suddenly swung his backside around and so naturally that that thing came out from him. Then he bit him. The wolverine bit him, but he wanted to block that skunk. At this, at this point, the skunk, at this point, the wolverine was knocked utterly senseless. He didn't know where he was. He was not crazy. So then the skunk went back. He won't be arriving, he said. It was far away in the country where they had, where they had their feast, far, far away from the ocean. But now the wolverine wanted to go down the bank because he couldn't see and he wanted to run amok. Now then, he went down a bank making a guess that the sea was there. He kept bumping into trees since he couldn't see. Who are you? He said to the tree. A spruce, it said. Now he started to walk along again. And again he bumped into a tree. Who are you? A birchwood, it said. Once more he began to go away. Again he bumped into a tree. Who are you? A birchwood, it said. At last the wolverine said, I might as well stay here among the knolls. I don't know where it is, so I'll try again, he said. At last he began to move off again. Again he bumped into a tree. Who are you? he asked. A balsam had replied. Now, now, he said, now I'm beginning to draw close to water, said the wolverine. He began to move about aimlessly some more. At last, as he bumped into a tree again, he said, who are you? I'm a cedar, it answered. It amounts to about the same thing if I stay here, said the wolverine. Now then, but now, then he started walking away again. So he walked about pretty much at random. Now again, he pretty well began, he bumped into something again. Who are you, he said. Uh, well, it's a willow bark, it said. And he was very glad. Now he, now he thought, this wolverine, I'm beginning to near the proper water. So now he began to walk away again, and now he bumped right into a tree. Who are you? I'm the black alder, it said. Now he became very happy as he, walked, as he walked along. At long last, he didn't discover anything with his feet. Finally, he heard something sounding just like the wind. Now he knew that there, but there he didn't know where the rolling, the, the rollers were coming in over there. At last, but at last he began to walk on. Suddenly he bumped into something. What are you, he said. I'm a stone, it said. At last he was very happy. Now at last he heard it. At last he, finally he, finally he knew he was beginning to wait out. So now he began, he began to wait up until it started to be covered with water. At last he began to wash himself. And that is why the ocean is song. A story by John Carpenter. And this story was probably related to Doug Ellis, the one who um, um, translated and uh, made this book called Cree Legends and Narratives, Atulakana, Nesatapaji Mona, probably the early 1960s. Told by John, and this book has a lot of narratives, a lot of legends in it. So I wanted to break a rule and tell that cool story that Johnny Carpenter would have told back in, let's just say, 1962, when I was 12 years old, just becoming a teenager. I hope you enjoy the rest of the program.
When the sun shines, the birds sing as she walks along the shores, James Bay. Flies high in the sky over the horizon. Mm -hmm. James Bay. October 19th. My parents' names were Thomas McLeod and Rubina Ann. She was a Carey before. Rubina Ann Carey. And she married Tom McLeod. Tom McLeod's father was Willie McLeod. His mother was uh, Ellen. Her name was Ellen Mark before he married. My, my mother's father was George Carey, George. and he married a Margaret late later. But my grandfathers, I remember them. Well, I liked them very much. <laughs> <laughs> so they must have been kind. <laughs>
met at a dance, eh? And that's where I met Gilbert, coming home from the dance. <laughs> oh, coming home from the dance? He walked me home. <laughs> Did he ask you to dance? Oh, yeah. A few times and then? We were dancing there, home. yeah. When we go walking and then. Walks and yeah. Just maybe sit around along the river. Yeah. On the bank. I got married on the 9th of October, 39th. Well, we stayed a while down with his parents. And then what made us move up to my parents' place, there was a, a flu came around it. Okay. And everybody got sick. So that's when we moved up with my parents in that big house. We had to go because I got sick too. I had a flu. We used to sleep upstairs. Okay. And uh, when it would rain, we had to put up a tent over our bed. Because yeah. it used to leak. Wow. <laughs> I was busy with myself. <laughs> Looking after my family. I used to have to make the clothing for the babies. Yeah. I sewed their clothing right until they were old enough running around and I made clothes for them. Well, my grandchildren wore moccasins. I made moccasins for them. Well, I didn't. I didn't go to work at the school until. Uh, no, I didn't go to work till after Kathy started going to school. Okay. Because I didn't want to leave her at home. So then I started working. I worked at the school. I worked at the bay. In the school, I taught Cree. I was the first one to teach Cree in the school. All kinds of people visiting. Very nice of you to come visit. Okay. Thank you yeah. very much. This is Stan Wesley's Moose Factory Heritage Moment. This has been Stan Wesley's Moose Factory Heritage Moment.
from my ancestors. I'm packing my old dabanas. This is my traditional outfit for my snowshoes ceremony. I'm putting on my snowshoes for the first time. Snowshoeing on the land of my ancestors in Wabraskat. I feel close to nature. This is what being in Innu means to me. Hello, my name is Wendy Kirk. I have chosen my story to reflect a historical perspective of the years 1965 to 1973 in Moose Factory. The year was 1965. My husband and I and two little girls trekked from Southern Ontario to Moose Factory to begin a new job and a new life. It was a journey that would last 35 years in the James Bay Lowlands. We had to use a map to identify our new locale. Our first trip on the Ontario Northland Railway train was an adventure in itself. We met Pat Gray of the Air Force Base and his family on the train, and they gave us lots of information about Northern living. A smiling Charlie Morrison met us at the station in Moosonee and conveyed us and our belongings to our new home. We settled into a can car unit near the site of the former post office. From the first day, I fell in love with the land and the people of Moose Factory. My husband John's job was as business administrator of the Moose Factory Island School Board. His responsibilities included Moose Fort School, Main School, and the Village School. We enjoyed many teachers over the years, including the late John Delaney, who became such a vital community member, and the late Rich Armstrong, who lost his life during a hunting incident. St. Thomas's Anglican Church was a thriving beacon looking over the river at this time. I remember a pot-bellied wood stove was the main heating source. Bishop Neville Clark, Suffragan Bishop of the Diocese of Moosonee, was in charge in 1965, assisted by the Reverend Grant Ward. Canon Sam Iserhoff was the beloved priest in charge of Cree services. I believe three services a Sunday were held, ably assisted by a wonderful choir, who later became recording artists, with Herbert McLeod as the organist. 1,200 people a day arrived on the newly created Polar Bear Express. A thriving tourist industry developed. The Anglican Church women of St. Thomas's provided hot dog lunches to hungry tourists, as well as providing a showcase for local arts and crafts in the parish hall. When the parish hall tragically burned down, the resourceful ladies operated under a tent within a few days. The Hudson's Bay Company, probably the original founders of a settlement on the island, provided a thriving store. Readers will remember J.J. Woods, Woody, the store manager, and Pat Patterson, the entertaining butcher who supplied recipes with his meat sales. Other employees included Elsie Chilton, Nellie Ferries, and Gloria McDonald, among many others. The bay was a social gathering spot and also supplied gas to the community. Cannons on the manager's lawn and the old fur press were landmarks. During this time, Horden Hall was operating as a residential school with children from the local area as well as Ojibwe communities. Derek Mills was the director overseeing the students and their supervisors. Weekly movie nights were enjoyed by the students as well as the public. 
Scouts and Cubs under Harris Glenn, Brownies and Guides with Joan Pugh, and J.A. with Wendy Kirk, Judy Danks, and Beulah Morrison were some of the activities enjoyed by the children. Also in 1973, a huge Boy Scout Jamboree was held on the grounds of Gordon Hall. I chose to highlight the years between 1965 and 73 from a historical perspective. I hope listeners have enjoyed a glimpse of their community some 56 years ago. Thank you. Okay, hello, my name is Cecil Chabot. I'm the executive director of the Moose River Heritage and Hospitality Association. As many of you know, I was born and raised in Moose Factory, and uh, I've been on the board of the MRHHA since the beginning, and I just stepped down last uh, spring to take up the role of part-time executive director, uh, working with uh, Fred Rickard, our community coordinator, and our many uh, volunteer committee members. Back in 1973, Moose Cree First Nation leaders and community members helped organize a major celebration of the 300th anniversary of the founding of Moose Factory as a permanent settlement and the establishment of Cree European transatlantic relations. That anniversary celebration had a big impact on our community and the Moose River Heritage and Hospitality Association wants to build on that legacy with a new initiative called More Than 350 in 2023 from time immemorial to 1673 to 2023. Our goal is to take advantage of this anniversary to advance our mission of building a future with our shared past. We want to center our commemoration around the deeper and broader history and territory of the Mususibi Aliluwak and to celebrate above all the heritage and tradition of hospitality that has seen many diverse people welcome into Moose Cree territory, friendships and families for centuries. We see this as a unique once-in-a-generation opportunity to help strengthen our communities in ways that integrate and impact education, heritage and language restoration, reconciliation, traditional and contemporary cultural and artistic development and flourishing, economic development, health, etc. In order to advance this broad objective, the MRHHA aims to build a close working relationship among its jurisdictional, organizational, business and individual members, as well as other local and regional organizations and other partners and participants across Canada and across the Atlantic. Hi, my name is Norm Wesley. A couple of things that I want to show you. The first of all, this, uh, this paddle. And you'll notice that there's an image on this paddle. And it's an image that most of you, well, all of you are familiar with if you're from Moosonee and Moose Factory, or you've been born and raised here, or if you've visited this place. And this is the first thing, and it's a gift that I was given by the, um, by the Select Vestry for the uh, years of service that I had with St. Thomas Church as their minister. The second thing I wanted to show you was this here. And I did, I did a, a wedding one time, Gerald McComb Jr. gave this to me as a gift of appreciation when I did their, when I did their, uh, their wedding. And you'll see that this also is a very nice portrait of St. Thomas Church. I'm the chair of the uh, St. Thomas Church Restoration Committee. And um, I, I, um, I just wanted to share that uh, with you that uh, this is a very important uh, project that we've undertaken and we hope that we can get your support as well uh, those of you who are living in Muslim Moose Factory and even beyond um, because this is an iconic building here in Moose Factory try googling Moose Factory Ontario and the image that will show up will be this image here that's how important and how significant and how iconic this building is and our job is to save this church so, I um, want to encourage you all to um, take part in this and uh, put this as something that's very, very important in the work of this community here in Moose Factory in Moose Knee. Mr. Miigwech, I hope you're enjoying the show. My name is Doug Evans. I'm a retired conservation architect and a member of the St. Thomas Committee. My job has involved the appraisal, conservation, repair and adaptive reuse of historic buildings and ancient monuments, working with church parish councils, charitable trusts and private clients, 
it has been a privilege to be able to assist them in conserving and adapting their historic buildings so they could pass them on to future generations in a renewed and revitalized condition. As a member of the St. Thomas Committee, I look forward to working with the Moose River Heritage and Hospitality Association and helping it to develop as a sustainable community organization, including the ability to fulfill its mission as custodian of this nationally important building. Thank you for this opportunity. Hello, my name is Doris. Having visited the wonderful communities of Moose Factory and Moose Knee for the past 10 years, I have walked by the white building with the steeple standing on guard of the cemetery and looking over the river. It was St. Thomas Church. This long history inspired me to volunteer my time to do some small part to help ensure this part of the community's heritage is shared not only in the north, but throughout Canada. it goes I was a kid at home kicking around the sticks and stones I was 13 and man I could dream I had a good life I would raise Summer trees. I was young, proud, and oh so free. Invasion forced upon me with the falling. Security. The lectures, the systems, and all that seen could not take away my dreams. Could not take away. Kids of my own The dreams are back and I let them roam The school days are long gone And I hold tight to my own throne Cause I know who a common man Rich in love with a red, red rose 
Her eyes release the boy in me Gave him wings and set me free A cooking and sleeping make warm. Canada geese fly south in fall at, and they fly north in spring. Wigwams are also known as wigwams. Welcome. Wajay. Thank you. Yes, Wajay. Clayton and Lynn. So we're so glad to have you here today. Uh, Clayton Chichu and uh, Lynn Harper Chichu. And um, they're going to share some music with us and maybe tell, tell, tell us some stories about their life here in Moose Factory. So winter is a time of storytelling. And, and I love your music because your music tells stories. And I'd like you to just kind of um, give us some insight into your um, process of making music and particularly about the video that we're going to the music video we're going to see today okay well the video we're going to be watching is the only thing and um, it speaks to the preservation of the land love family the treaties and the traditions as well and the culture of the area and there's a lot of lovely footage of the er this particular area into the James Bay region. But it also talks about, you know, the, the issues facing not only Indigenous communities, but the world right now, like economic crises and food shortages. So it kind of touches on those elements are within there. But the ultimate, I, I would say, the message is love is the only thing that's going to last, you know. Right, right. Okay. So, um, so did you write the, the lyrics, Lynn? Yeah. Or did you, was it a collaboration between the two of you? We collaborated with ideas. I, I ended up writing the lyrics. Clayton came up with some ideas for the lyrics as well. And he wrote the musical, like he, he actually structured the chords because I wasn't playing piano on this particular tune. So um, I relied on him to sort of provide the backing initially. And then we, when we went in the studio, we each added our parts and percussion mm -hmm. and, and synthesizer and whatnot. Yeah, and I, I saw at the end of the credits of the video, there's a, a number of different musicians from Moose Factory who supported you on this project too. Yeah, well, on Red Willow Bending, there's a lot of different, like Lawrence Cheech, who played guitar on a few of the tracks. He's really good. Nelson Alasapi, George Whittem. Am I missing anyone? <laughs> oh, Paul, Paul Wesley is actually from Cash. He did the chant on Love is the Only Thing, and he did a beautiful job. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, Stan Ludet did the video for Cree Wino, as he is known. <laughs> he did the video for this particular song, which was really great. That kind of started us off, and and then we went from there and and began making our own videos. So that was fun. Yeah. So this this song is part of a uh, album of of songs that you made, right? Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, and and what's the name of the the CD? Uh, Red Willow Bending.
Took my number off the wall Promised she would never call Love is the only thing that's gonna last Love is the only thing that's gonna last Floodgates are open the wide Food shortage on the rise It's no fantasy Thing that's gonna last. 
musical families. And uh, Clayton, I, I'm sure everyone knows uh, your parents, Daisy and James Chichu. And, um, and Lynn, you, you also have a, a sister who's very musical. And so can you tell us a little bit about your, the influence of music in your life? Who, who would you like to start? Okay, I'll start. <laughs> Um, well, uh, my goodness, I've been playing for many years. Um, made several albums with Siren. Clayton joined us on our second album, uh, Wisdom of the Heart. That's where we first met. Started working together before we came up here. Um, our first recording for Siren uh, was nominated for Juno, which was nice to be recognized in the reggae category. And, and we toured a lot. And then when after Clayton joined us, we did a lot of touring as well. But we finally came up here after Marlon was born. And so we've been living in Moose Factory since the winter of 94. So oh, a long time. Yeah. You know, we travel, but this is our home. Mm -hmm. OK. So um, and tell me how important you think is, music is, not just to you personally, but to family life and, and to the community. Jeez. Well, I think music, well, there's, to the community, there, there's a certain kind of music that Clayton could probably speak to, you know, the fiddle music. Um, um, we produced, actually, uh, James and Daisy, mom and dad's recording of Sheshi Man, which was uh, traditional fiddle music of James Bay. And they're all like 300-year-old fiddle music, fiddle tunes that came over, uh, you know, during the time of the Hudson Bay Company. So they're very, it's very rare and it had never been recorded before. So when uh, Ontario Arts Council and Canada Council heard about it, they jumped on it immediately and said, yes, yes, it sounds great, let's do it. So um, that's a big, you know, obviously fiddle music and the tradition itself, you know, is a really big part of the community, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're actually going to be doing a feature on uh on your parents, uh, Clayton. So, uh, so this is nice mm -hmm. that we can uh, get this background um, to the, to that uh, that project. So, okay. yeah, I mean, they're ninety one, and Dad still plays a bit, but not not as he can't play long enough now. Like, but he still, you know, is active yet in the, in playing the fiddle yet. So, so Mum is still at the spoons and. Uh, playing along uh, with the uh, and the and the drum as well too, mm -hmm. yeah. So, so they're doing good. Yeah. James Chichu began playing the fiddle in the 1940s at the age of 12. He taught himself the fiddle by ear and by listening to the old fiddle tunes of his father Noah and other local Cree fiddlers. In 1998. James recorded a CD titled Che Chiman, a Cree word meaning big ship and referring to the three-masted fur trade sailing ships that brought the HBC fur trade and the fiddled music to James Bay. James is recording as a remembrance of 10 square dance tunes from his youth. Each tune is associated to a particular square dance. Some tunes are named in Cree and can also identify the accompanying dance. One of the fiddle tunes on the CD is Sigabon Hegan. In Cree, Sigabon refers to the traditional Cree way of cooking a Canadian goose. Sigabon Hegan is a dance which features the couples hooking elbows and swinging in the square dance set. James and his wife Daisy and family members have traveled to various festivals in Canada and the United States presenting stage performances and workshops in the fiddle music tradition of the James Bay Cree. In 2013, James and Daisy traveled to Aberdeen, Scotland and to the Orkney Islands to participate in various musical events and festivals. In 2013, the Moose Cree First Nation bestowed a lifetime achievement recognition to James and Daisy 
for their contribution to the tradition of fiddle music in James okay. Bay. Mm -hmm. about life in the north and especially living on moose factory moose factory has this very special feel about it it's an island and it's it's in uh, the moose river and uh, it's a real journey to travel there every time i go there you know you have to take the train from from uh, Cochrane. it's a two-day journey you get to moose and knee and then you take the the boat across the river to the island and it's like another for me it's like another world and i just i i i just have such a a connection to, to that place but but you live there and and i know that uh, i know that you have those feelings too about about uh, moose factory but can you share some insights as to why you keep living there? What, what is it about that place that keeps you there? Oh, did you want to speak to that? Well, actually, well, well <laughs> me, for myself, like, you know, um, I'm sure Lynn too, but for me, it, this is where our family's from, Moose Factory, like uh, our, our family, Chichu's my grandfathers and stuff so this is where my ancestors on my dad's side uh come from this area so mm -hmm. it's, in a sense it's our our homeland basically where we come from so you know this is just home mm -hmm. you know, and, and whatever happens here is is just there's is family there's history here of our families so what kind of what else can we say? <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is and, the, and we love the trees and we love the rivers and we hope it stays that way. <laughs> what else can we say? I mean, yeah. it's beautiful to be surrounded by waters that are fresh still, yeah. um, forests that are untouched, and we really uh, we think that's a beautiful thing. We like to see that preserved. And your children have chosen to stay there which which must be make you very happy i wanted to i wanted to raise them in the tradition in an indigenous environment i didn't want them to grow up in the city i wanted them to learn about their culture my daughter's heading out to university and she's been um she's going to be um studying law indigenous law she's just graduating out of college right now and so and my uh, my son he's always been very much involved with the culture here with power music and singing and He's also carrying on the tradition. He's a good guitar player, a good singer. He likes to write. So it's it's nice. You know, we have that. We have our own studio here so we can continue to be creative. So, you know, we're actually very fortunate. Hello and watch a Moosini and Moose Factory. My name is Christine Rickard and I am the eldest daughter to Anne Wesley of Moose Factory. It's been a while since I have lived in the communities but it's definitely a place that holds many amazing experiences and memories that create the person that I am today. Living in the South has made me realize just how unique my stories are of growing up in the James Bay area. When given the opportunity to be part of the more than 350 in 2023 committee, I immediately agreed as it gives me a reason to reconnect with family and friends and celebrate the place that I ultimately call home. Growing up in a place 
that is so rich in history, traditional lifestyle, and family values can sometimes be taken for granted, and I am so excited to participate in collectively acknowledging and celebrating these unique communities. Thank you, and miigwech. This is Stan Wesley's Moose Factory Heritage Moment. Hey! Yeah, I'm heading up to Harl's! Gonna buy myself a pop and chip. Beverly Hills Cop. My cousin's saying that's really good, eh? Me. Mm. Real nice. But you know, the other night I was there looking for a movie. Waited three hours, stood by the door for somebody to return it. Ah, oh, there's people there. Eh? Keep the movies long. But that's okay. Tonight, they don't have it there. I'm gonna go to Gigi's. The movie shack. See if they have it there. And if not, I'll go over to EJ's. See if they have it there. Go on, just stuck someone ever desperate to watch a movie, but my cousin says it's good. Kind of have it in my head. I'm gonna watch a movie tonight. I'm determined. Nice. This has been Stan Wesley's Moose Factory Heritage Moment. Wache, welcome. I'm Virginia Barter, and this is Paula Rickard. We're we're here together to talk about uh, the 350th anniversary uh, celebrations that are coming up. And as part of that, we've got a, a topic we want to share with you, Paula. Yes, uh, one topic that I think everyone will find interesting is genealogy and how we are all connected to one another, but we'll focus just on one branch of my very huge family tree. My genealogy research included many conversations with my aunt, um, Eva, who is no longer here. She um, passed on um, a couple of years ago. And but she, I had the opportunity to sit with Eva and had many phone calls with her to talk about uh, genealogy and family history. And she shared with me so much history, so so many stories about Dinah, my um, my great great um, grandmother. And one of the stories was, um, and um, way back when, when my grandmother was a great, uh, when Granny Chum was still living, she lived by the river, and she had her grandson. Um, and her nephew, one of her nephews, um, she was making plans to go to her camp and she needed, uh, and she had to fly to get to her camp. So what she did was she had her grandson help her carry um, her, all her camping supplies, all her camping gear down to the river. And she, they put them in the canoe. And then she, um, if you're familiar with the area, she had to um, paddle south uh, to the south end of the island, which we, and that area today, we, we call it the dikes. So she traveled to that area, unloaded her stuff, and um, set up camp for the night. And we're talking like she set up camp on Moose Factory Island. Meanwhile, she lived a half a mile away from the location where she set up camp. And... Uh, so she woke up the next day and the plane landed right there by the river uh, where she was camping and she loaded up onto the plane and she went camping. So um, I was telling my father about this and he said, uh, well, she was smart. You have to remember back then there was no taxis. And so she did what she needed to do to make sure that she was able to be in that spot to catch the plane. And so she, um, she, she had a plan to go camping and she did what she needed to do to make sure she carried out all those activities to implement her plan. You know, so um, myself, I like to consider myself a, um, yeah, I, I like to consider myself a planner. So I think um, that's part of where I like to think that's where I got that characteristic from was from her, you know, that. So you got more pictures? Are there more pictures? Yes, I do. And so this is, again, her husband, Angus. And um, I have another picture of, uh, I believe this picture here of my granny chum was a little bit, she was a little bit um, older than her husband was in this picture. But um, 
this is, I really like this picture of my grandmother. She looks so sweet there. Mm -hmm. This is um, Henry Sailors. Uh, Henry is um, my granny chum's father. Henry Sailors was about 52 years old in 1905 when he was one of the signatories to the James Bay Treaty. So that's one of the things he did. And if you can see on the picture there, there's this, um, this uh, medallion, and I believe that was from the signing of the treaty. And oh, wow, so, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah. So I like to believe that, uh, that he believed that signing the treaty was a good thing for our people. Because today, people have different um, interpretations and perspectives about the treaty today. But I like to believe that he thought it was a good thing. You know, otherwise, why would he sign it? So Henry Sailors, his parents were Jacob Sailors and Rachel Goodwin, okay? And Henry Sailors was great, great grandson of Dr. Robert Goodwin and uh, Mr. Goose. And Dr. Robert Goodwin is, um, was a full-blooded Englishman who came here to work for the Hudson's Bay Company and um, as a doctor. So the first place that he traveled to when he came here was he went to East Maine where he was... Uh, a company surgeon. And from there, he changed roles over the years until um, his passing in uh, 1805. Um, my, um, my grandmother, Laura. So this would be um, Henry's, no, um, Dinah Sailors and Angus Chum's daughter is Laura. So she's the woman in the picture. And her husband is George, George Rickard. And my dad is sitting, uh, my grandpa George is holding my dad. And then the, the boy in the middle is my uncle Oliver. And then the girl to the beside my grandmother is my aunt Eva, the one who shared many stories with me about um, our granny chum. And all of the people in the picture here, they have all since passed away. Um, do you wanna say anything uh, to encourage other people to carry on in this? Um their genealogy searches or, or how, how do you think this will fit into our 350th anniversary mm -hmm. celebration? Well, definitely a lot of our people are descendants of Hudson Bay um, fur traders, explorers. Um, when, if we look hard enough into our ancestry, we will find those connections. There are other um, Hudson Bay uh, fur traders and other branches of my family tree. And my genealogy research has, is showing how our communities are connected to each other. And um, my genealogy also gives me a different perspective on people because I, I look at people in a different way. If I'm in the line at the grocery store or if I'm in my vehicle and I drive by someone, I, my, man, my mind automatically spins um, to thinking about how I'm related to that, to that person or how those people that I'm seeing are related to each other. And I've discovered that I'm related to many people all along the James Bay coast and in Moose Factory as well. And um, there's a lot of interesting uh, uh, stories. There's a lot of funny stories that have come from my research. And one of the best things that come from my research is understanding, hearing about the uh, traditional practices um, that our ancestors did you know, in Moose Factory. And of course, reading, um, again, going back to focusing on Dr. Robert Goodwin, um, he was a doctor. And I'd like to think that the, um, that interest in healthcare somehow, you know, travels throughout the uh, different generations, because I have a, there's a number of um, healthcare providers in my family today. And um, through all my genealogy research as well, gives me a different perspective on culture and because I've had the opportunity to hear um, stories about cultural practices and beliefs that I'm able to today um, give advice on the use and placement of culture into um, 
programs and services that will help our uh, people today. And that, um, that ability became stronger for, um, through my genealogy research. And so uh, my genealogy research is definitely more than just making those connections between uh, families and people. It, is give it, it has opened up um, uh, a bigger window for me in terms of looking at culture and how important culture is to us today and how it um, supports our well-being. Hello, Moose Factory and Moosini. I am a member of Save the St. Thomas Committee. I joined in the hopes of seeing our old St. Thomas Anglican Church restored to its original place of worship. My name is Trudy Sailors, and I am a parishioner of the St. Thomas Anglican Church in Moose Factory, Ontario. I look forward to the time when we can once again all meet in person to fellowship and learn as a parish. Also, to continue the work to save the St. Thomas. Blessings to all. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I realize that probably none of you know who I am. Uh, my name is Thomas Blompier, and I'm working on my history PhD at the University of Toronto, and I've chosen to do my research on the Moosonee and Moose Factory area. And in particular, I've chosen to look at how the coming of the railway in the 1930s to today and how that has changed um, relations in the region. I have to confess that I've never visited Moosonee or Moose Factory, and I'm afraid that I only know the area through archives and through books and through photographs. If this past year had been different, I was very much looking forward to a visit, um, but that will have to be sometime in the future. There are three main reasons that I chose to get involved with the MRHHA. First being that I wanted to connect with people in the area uh, and also people who find the area interesting, just as I do. I wanted to help with the commemorations um, because it is such a special heritage in the area and I wanted to be part of celebrating that and preserving that for future generations. And the other reason is I, I wanted to help set the record straight. When you look at the region so much like I do through archives, um, you get a very one-sided story. Uh, and I wanted to be able to help uh, local communities um, get their side of those stories um, onto the record as well. And so I'm really looking forward to ongoing commemoration events, especially into 2023, uh, and I look forward to meeting some of you in person um, in, in the future. Hello, uh, my name's Eli Chilton. I'm from Moose Factory, Ontario. Um, I work for the John Argelaney Youth Centre. I'm 
am the DJ and producer and youth worker for CJFI 107.1 FM The Island. And uh, I'm here uh, to take part in the Storyteller series as a playwright, as a writer. And I'll be reading uh, a couple of excerpts, a couple of scenes uh, from my new play, my new untitled play. And uh, yeah, so I'll, be, I'll just start. And uh, here it is. Uh, act two, scene one. Lights up, curtains open. The light is fading on the day. It is dusk. It is quite windy out. Clouds have rolled and obscuring what daylight is left. The tarp on the roof of the tent frame is moving about, even more from the strong winds. The tent is dark and monochromatic from the lack of daylight. In the distance, the crunching of snow can be heard from walking. Solomon is on his way home after a half day's hunt in a snow blind. The rhythm of the walking is off. It actually sounds more like limping and hobbling through the snow. The snow gets the sound gets ever more closer until the latch of the door is heard opening and the door is swung open abruptly. Solomon appears through the doorway, hobbled and using his walking stick as a crutch and his gun strapped on his shoulder and his bag on his back. Solomon Honey, I'm home. Son of a gun, that smarts. Solomon appears to be wet as well on his jacket and pants. He favors one leg and his right foot is somewhat elevated, attempting not to put any pressure on his foot and ankle. He takes the shotgun off his shoulder and puts it into the corner of the tent. Solomon leans on the doorway, against the doorway, careful not to drop his crutch and loosens the bag from his back and drops it into the same corner. He closes the door behind him and hobbles over to the chair and plops down into it. Solomon, damn it. He sits and collects himself in his pain, breathing and concentrating. He looks over to his table and reaches for some matches, takes one out and strikes it and lights a couple of nearby candles. The tent is dimly lit by the candles. Solomon looks at his right foot and ankle. I don't think it's broken. It's painful, but not that painful. He reaches under behind his knee and lifts his right leg. He outstretches his foot to make a circular motion with his booted foot. Solomon can make it a little can make it a little before he the pain hits him. Solomon, God. He puts his leg down gently. Solomon. I couldn't do that if I broke it. Hopefully I didn't fracture it or rip or tear anything. If I'm lucky I sprained it. Damn it, I should have been more careful trying to catch that wounded goose. I got it, but at a cost. Twisted my foot trying to reach out for that goose. Fell in the water, too. Solomon looks at his jacket, which is wet, but not soaked. He takes it off and leaves it, leaves it hanging on the chair. He looks at the little clock on the table. Solomon, geez, it took me almost over an hour to get back. The walk is usually about 20-25 minutes. Solomon looks around the tent and concentrates. Tired. I can feel sleeping coming on strong. He blows out the candles and gets up slowly with the help of his crutch. Solomon leaps over to his bedside and sits down. He places the walking stick against the wall and adjusts his sleeping bag. Solomon. No fire tonight. Just my trusty blanket here. Gotta keep my boots on. Take a look-see at my foot in the morning. Damn, I feel tired. He lies back in his bed and throws his sleeping bag over himself. Solomon. Honey, you wouldn't believe what happened to me today. Yeah, yeah. I hear you, Pops. I gotta. I gotta. Solomon falls asleep in the dark tent. The sun has gone down altogether now. And Solomon sleeps soundly on his bed in the corner of the tent. It's still quite windy outside the tent, and the tarp occasionally whips up and down against the tent frame. Act 2, Scene 2. It is the early morning. Dawn is beginning to break. Solomon is sleeping soundly in the exact same place, with the blanket pulled over him, and his hip waders are still on. There is a light rain that's pattering on the tarp roof. He snores and breathes deeply occasionally. The light from the sun begins to brighten the tent frame. In the corner of the tent, something moves. It comes out of the shadow to reveal itself. 
it, reveal, it, it appears to be a marten. The marten is brown and about 20 inches in length. It smells the floor and the air and timidly moves deeper into the tent and looks at Solomon lying in bed. It jumps up over the chair near the foot, onto the chair near the foot of his bed. It stands a moment and stares at Solomon. The Martin jumps to the floor and walks over to another bed frame that is empty on the other side of the table and leaps up on it. It timidly s steps onto the table and stands a moment again to look at Solomon. The animal is strangely familiar with Solomon as it looks at him. Solomon's breathing changes and he slowly lifts his head from his sleep to look in the direction of the Martin standing on the table. The Martin is startled at being seen and skitters off the table and onto the floor with two giant leaps and it bounds through the hole in the doorway and disappears into the rainy morning light. Solomon drops his head onto his pillow and falls back asleep. The rain continues to fall outside and the morning daylight increasingly becomes brighter. Solomon shifts in his bed and sleeps on. That was a reading from uh, my new untitled play um, Act 2, Scene 1, and Act 2, Scene 2. Um, the play is about a, a, an elder um, who's hunting, spring hunting, at his goose camp um, by himself, and he hosts uh, a man and his son later on in the in the season, and the story continues from there. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I hope to finish it later this year. Uh, thank you, and have a good day. Hi, everybody. My name is Sheila Wiesk. I am one of the committee members for the 350 in 2023 celebration. One of the reasons why I joined this committee is to celebrate the Mushkegwak culture, heritage, and history, to preserve it for the Musini and Musakri in James Bay area. Miigwech. Wachia, Woods Factory, and Musini. My name is Jane Scanlon, and I'm a member of the St. Thomas Committee. I lived on Moose Factory Island between the years of 1964 and 1969, when my father, the Reverend Jim Scanlon, was the priest at St. Thomas. I have many good memories of the community and the church. And in fact, I kept this lovely painting of the church, which my family took with us when we moved on in 1969. I'm very committed to the restoration of this church, and I will be giving my time and my money. And I invite you to do the same. Megwitch. I am a member of the Save St. Thomas Committee. I was very pleased to be asked to join in and help in this effort because the church, the historic church of St. Thomas, um, meant a lot to me. Uh, it means a lot to me. Um, all four of my children, Ryan, Rachel, Kendall and Sarah were all uh, born in Moose Factory and were baptized in St. Thomas's. Of course, Mark and I were married uh, in the St. Thomas Church as well. I served as a uh, vestry member while I lived in Moose Factory and uh, I was a choir member um, with uh, so many, so many other community members, uh, some who have uh, passed on, um, but I have great memories of um, practicing and talking and all kinds of shenanigans with Monroe and Elsie and Daisy and uh, other other members who uh, uh, were so much fun. Uh, so much good social activity associated with that. We sang, of course, at a lot of wakes, and that 
that brings me to one of the important things about uh, St. Thomas is that almost every, I'm sure virtually every um, community member has been through those doors. So thank you Miigwech for everybody who participated in this launch of the events that will be coming. Um, we look forward to seeing you again and we um, really enjoyed the time spent here. Yes, thank you so much. And uh, we really encourage you to, to participate and uh, come out and join our committee and we welcome your ideas. And uh, really this is gonna be a, a, a great time and just think we'll be telling these stories to our grandchildren. Storytelling. This is what we have done. We've told a story of who we are, our past, our history, and about this building here and what we would like to see in the future, a restored building, part of our history, part of our past. And the last story I want to share with you is this one. It's a story that is short, is brief, it's a profound story. It's a story about Moses leading his people out of Egypt. And the Lord speaks to him, God speaks to Moses. And he says, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you're to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. We have been blessed with our past in many ways. And good, bad, or indifferent, we take those things of the past and we work them to make us stronger, stronger than ever. The next story will be the restoration of this building to make it new again as a reminder of our past, our her heritage. And it's that same priestly blessing that the Lord instructed Moses that I leave with you, that we leave with you, that we will continue to be blessed with the future, with hope, with the promise of peace in the end. We thank you for watching this program. It's Jimmy Gwesh. Get an ask him at the